One of the ayat that we have revealed about Hajj, and I know Hajj is something that has passed, and now we're looking ahead, we're looking forward into the coming months. But there are a lot of lessons that we learn during Hajj which are universal. al ibra bi umum al You know, Allah Azza wa Jal, He'll reveal certain things in the Quran, and their context is specific. It's speaking about a specific incident, it's a commandment about a specific issue. However, the ruling that we derive from it is a general ruling. It can be applied at any time. It can be applied in any place. Among these rulings, one that is specifically important for us to remember, especially now as the summer comes and we have heat and we become sweaty and people start to take off their clothes, unfortunately, in the society, one of the most beautiful reminders that we learn from Hajj is where Allah Azza wa Jal, He reveals to the believers, He says, Ya Bani Adam, or in fact, He reveals this to all of humanity. He says, Ya Bani Adam, O son of Adam, O children of Adam, خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدْ Dress your best whenever you approach the masjid, whenever you approach the mosque, whenever you approach worship in general. Dress your best. And eat and drink, but do not go into extremes in this. Indeed, Allah does not love those who are wasteful, who are extravagant. Now, a little bit about the context of this ayah before we speak about some of the points of benefits that we can derive from this. The Arabs in the time of Jahiliyyah, after Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail السلام, after they have built the Kaaba as we know it, people started to make pilgrimage and they, cut, and they came to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. But over time, as the religion, as the deen, as the millah, the path of Ibrahim السلام, was lost, people started worshiping idols. And they started putting idols within the walls of the Kaaba. And then they started doing tawaf around the Kaaba, and they started doing a lot of strange things that has nothing to do, that had nothing to do with Islam, that had nothing to do with Ibrahim salam. One of those things that they would do is that they would take off all of their clothes. They would take off all of their clothes, everything that they were wearing, and they would do tawaf around the Kaaba. And the reason and the explanation that they gave for this was that we dress in these clothes and in our day-to-day -day lives, we commit many sins. Now we are coming to visit the house of Allah. You know, we are coming to visit a sacred place. We don't want to be dressed in all of these articles of clothing in which we commit all of these sins. You know, perhaps it's a good intention, but look, look how corrupt it is. Now you're approaching the house of Allah, you're in the presence of Allah, and you're not wearing anything at all, resembling animals. And so Islam came, and the Prophet ﷺ came, and he removed all of this. He purged all of these excesses, all of these deviancies, and brought the Kaaba, Mecca, the house of Allah, and the place of his worship back to how it was supposed to be, how Ibrahim ﷺ had always designed it. Allah he says, Ya Bani Adam, this is one of those things to remember. This is not something which is specific to the believers, not specific to the Muslims. You know this dress that we have? This is something blessed by Allah. This is one of those amazing blessings and distinguishing features and characteristics that Allah gave to human beings in order to honor them as opposed to most of other creation. The animals don't wear this. In fact, the removal of clothes was one of the things that happened when Adam السلام, ate from the tree. Exposed. They were exposed. So this is something we know by fitrah, by our natural inclination. And then Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, خُذُوا زِينَتَكُمْ عِنْدَ كُلِّ مَسْجِدْ Wear your best, dress your best when you are approaching any masjid. And again, this is al-khitab al-am, this is general. 
And you know, this is something that we understand. I grew up in a very Christian society. You know, today, the, the, the UK that exists as it is, is a very secular society. So maybe we don't feel the effects of Christianity as much as we used to. But go down to Westminster School, go down to Westminster Abbey, see some of the effects of that church that still exists today. And even where I grew up in the US, you know, Christianity as a religion has become something which is very much on the weekend, practiced one day a week on Sundays. But you know, when they practice their religion on the Sundays, and when they go to the church, they wear their best clothing. They bring out their suits, they bring out everything that is nice, they, they bring out their absolute best clothing, and then they sit in the church. Of course, then they leave it and they go do everything else that they want. But for those few moments, those, those few hours, they are dressed in their best. And in fact, they have a term for it. They call it their Sunday best. You know, they have their best pieces of clothing saved for those few hours on Sunday. This is something that they know. This is something that everybody knows. You know, when we are approaching the masjid, when we are approaching salah, we're in a meeting. We are putting our head down in order to worship Allah Azza wa Jal, to remember Allah Azza wa Jal. We are in a conversation and speaking with the Almighty. If any of us, most of us here are employed, we have jobs. You know, there are certain dress codes that we have when we go to work. We make sure that we are dressed appropriately. It would be absolutely unacceptable for us to go to our jobs, to our workplaces, dressed like bums wearing shorts, a, a t-shirt, and just going there and, and, and trying to work. No, of course, in most places, in most respectable jobs and positions, this would be completely unacceptable. And yet we are coming to the house of Allah in order to worship Allah al-Razzaq, the one who in fact gives us all of the risk that we have. Your work, my work, all of that is a means. Allah can take it today, give it tomorrow, give you something else. All of that will come and go. Allah is the one who provides for us. And we are in a meeting with Allah Azza wa Is it appropriate that we should be in the house of Allah, that we should be in salah when our backs are showing completely? Is that appropriate in any way? Allah gave us so many ni'am. Allah gave us the ni'mah, the blessing of our clothes. Allah gave us this beautiful masjid. Allah gave us all that we have. Is this the type of laziness that we display when we are in the presence of Allah and when we are worshiping Him? And what does this reflect for us in our own iman and character? You know, whenever Allah gives us a blessing, we are either grateful for it or we are ungrateful for it. If we show gratitude to Allah Azza wa Jal for the blessings that we have been given, لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Then Allah will certainly increase us in those blessings. And if we do not show gratitude to Allah Azza wa Jal for those blessings, then إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيد Then certainly the punishment of Allah is severe. Now there, there are certain parameters. How do we understand what it means to be dressed well? What it means to be you know, dress properly when we come to the masjid. What are the adab, the etiquettes of the masjid? Specifically with regards to ourselves. You know, perhaps I might seem harsh. And the reality is that all of us, it's easy for us to sometimes get weak. You know, many of us, we, we have sweat, we start to smell. All of these things happen. But as long as we are on top of it, and we are trying to take care of it, then inshallah Allah will forgive us for our shortcomings. The problem is that when we don't even consider this as a problem to begin with, this is the real issue. So what does it mean for us? خُذُوا زِينَتُكُمْ What are the dawabit? What are the scales of measurement by which we can be sure that we are not displeasing Allah while we are worshipping Him? There are a few things. The Prophet ﷺ, first and foremost, he said, الطَّهَارَةُ شَطْرُ iman that purity and cleanliness is half of iman. We need to make sure that we follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. On Fridays, we need to make sure that we do ghusl at the least. We need to make sure that we are in a state of wudu. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا النِّسَاءُ الطِّيبِ He says, two things have been made 
beloved to me from this world, women and perfumes. The Prophet ﷺ, he loved his wives and he took care of them and he cherished them and he protected them. This was something beloved to him. And also to smell nice, to smell beautiful. The Prophet ﷺ, oftentimes he would turn away some of the Sahaba from the masjid and tell them to clean their mouths and come back when the smell of garlic or some of these condiments were found on them. Because we have to show respect and love to the house of Allah. And then it comes to our clothing. We have to make sure that we are dressed appropriately, that we are not showing our aura. First and foremost, this is the most important thing, that we are not showing those areas on our bodies which are private parts. Now I'm not saying that everybody has to wear a thobe and they have to wear this and that, no. But whatever we wear, it should be respectable in society. If we're wearing a shirt and pants, we should tuck them in so that when we go into sujood and we go into ruku', our backs don't start showing. We should make sure that we wear pants or you know, even if it's shorts, it should go below our you know, knees so that they're not exposed. These are all parts and you know, part and parcel of the masjid and the etiquettes of the masjid and how we show shukr to Allah Azza wa Jal for the masjid and for what we have been given. And finally, there are two points of benefit with regards to this. The first point of benefit is that how we are dressed as Muslims, as believers, is not only for ourselves, but it's for everybody. We live in a culture and we live in a society that prefers nakedness, that prefers removing clothes, that prefers being lazy, looking lazy. When we as Muslims, when we dress up and we dress nicely, we are sending a message to everyone as well that this is who we are. One of the biggest complaints we find people talk about Muslim and Eastern cultures with is what? A lack of professionalism, a lack of you know, order, a lack of all of these things. And they're not true. But it doesn't help when we, when we promote this idea and this belief in how we look, in how we speak, in how we behave. We have to be cognizant and careful and remember that in each and every single moment we are du'at, we are carrying the deen of Allah to wherever we go. Whether it's our own families and people who don't follow the deen in our families, whether it is to the workplace and people who do not know anything about Islam except for what you show them. In all of these situations we are carrying the religion of Allah to people and we have to make sure that we are the best presentations of that religion because first impressions, they, they matter. How people see us matters. And we have to always be careful of this. And secondly, how we dress is min al-ibadah. This is the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. You know, before we go into salah, what do we do? We wash ourselves during the wudu. Now one might ask the question, why is it important for a person to do wudu before they go into salah? What does that have to do with this? But the reality is that Allah Azza wa Jal, He asks and He expects from us what? That we submit to Him. And He shows us in this, that we externally cleanse ourselves and then we go into the salah so that we can internally cleanse ourselves. Many times people ask, I don't feel khushu in salah. I don't feel the sweetness of the prayer. Why don't I feel this? What can I do to change this? Is your wudu proper? Are you wearing the best clothes that would put you in a state of khushu? Are you smelling nice such that you feel, you know, the spirituality when you're in the masjid? Certainly our khushu would be decreased if the first thing that happens is we come across the doors of the masjid and we just smell socks everywhere. Now part of it is we have to deal with it. We have, we're alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful blessing that we are so many people here. Big blessing from Allah, so some of these things will happen naturally. But if we as individuals make sure just very simply that we put on a fresh pair of socks before we come, it will ripple out and it will make the masjid a much cleaner place. 
These are all individual personal responsibilities. And then Allah Azza wa Jal He says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and don't be wasteful. Don't be extravagant in all of this. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal mention this with the clothing? Because as some of the ulama, Shaykh al-Islam, he mentions this. He says that people would also refuse to eat and drink. They would be fasting when they are doing tawaf. And Allah Azza wa Jal, He said that, no, this is not necessary. You can eat and you can drink. Just be moderate in that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He said, مَا مَلَاءَ آدَمِيُّنْ وِعَاءً شَرَّ مِنْ بَطْنِهِ That a man has never filled anything that is worse than his stomach. Like completely filled. And we know that the stomach is the root of all diseases throughout your body. It can affect your bloodstream, it can affect your nervous system, it can affect everything across your body if you're not putting something that is good in there. Whatever good you put in there, that good is what will come out. And this is something for us to remember once again, that we make sure that what we eat and what we consume is good. Such that we can be in a state of afiyah, a state of good health that allows us to then improve our worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذم فاستغفروا إنه الغفور الرحيم. الحمد لله. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. You know, as harsh as this khutbah perhaps has been, I wish, I really wish that this was simply the only thing that we could talk about. But recently, as I'm sure many of us have heard and read and seen on the news, Israel, just a few days ago, attacked killed and injured hundreds of innocent people in a refugee camp in Jenin, in northern Palestine. There were dozens of people that were killed, hundreds that were injured, thousands were displaced and forced to flee their homes. Schools and hospitals were damaged on purpose, attacked and targeted on purpose. This severely damaged their operational capacities. Water and electricity networks were destroyed. Medical care was prevented from the, those who were injured. Human, human, humanitarian aid workers were prevented from reaching those who needed help and assistance. And all of this was stated, not from my own mouth, but this is just conveying the words of the UN Secretary General. This is something in which no doubt exists that this occurred. In fact, some UN independent human rights experts said that these actions in Jenin amount to egregious violations of international law and standards on the use of force and may constitute war crimes. You know, the reality is that most of our nations, they won't use the word war crimes when it comes to Israel because they're strong allies. But if the targeted attack of hospitals and the damage of their operational capacities and the prevention of human aid workers from reaching those in need and attacking hundreds of civilians with thousands of soldiers and air support is not an expression of war crimes, then only Allah knows best what really is. And if all of that was not enough, just several days ago, a bill was tabled by the UK Parliament which seeks to limit and curb BDS rights that people have. Now some people might wonder, what is this? BDS refers to boycott, divestment, sanctions. This was started on university campuses with a lot of students that sought to boycott products, that sought to sanction, you know, these states and these nations that were committing oppression and injustice across the globe. 
and to put pressure on them so that they stop doing all of these things and that they allow people to live and they allow people to breathe. But because, and, and you know what, the reality is that the West is perfectly fine with all of these sanctions for a lot of nations across the earth. There is no problems with putting these sanctions on people that they're not allies with. But all of a sudden when these same actions, these same crimes are perpetrated with allies, then this leads to this, this leads to that, this leads to that. They say that BDS leads to anti-Semitism. Even when a number of Jewish academics, including the director of Birkbeck Institute for the Study of Anti-Semitism, he said, completely rejecting the notion that BDS's mo motivation is rooted in anti-Semitism, or that an active BDS campaign is safe, thriving Jewish lives are inherently in tension and cannot coexist within the same communal space is completely wrong. This has nothing to do with that. This is not the targeting of any people, of any communities, of any religions, of any races. This is the targeting and the pressure of a government that is committing crimes against innocent people and trying to get them to stop. And to try and prevent this, to try and prevent people and young people, students and activists from speaking out against this, not only infringes on their civil rights and their liberties, not only infringes on their free speech, but it also disenfranchises and marginalizes those people that are trying to do what is right and those people that are trying to speak the truth. <coughs> there are a lot of efforts that are going in order to prevent this and we have to make sure that we learn what they are. We have to make sure that we get involved and we have to make sure that we are supporting our Palestinian brothers and sisters, innocent civilians, we are supporting the Muslims, the Christians, and everybody else that is being persecuted in that land. Because persecution is not acceptable for us as Muslims. Not in a state of peace and not in a state of war. And it is similarly not acceptable that we sit silently while these crimes are being per perpetrated by anybody. We have to make sure that we take the steps that are necessary and that we remain strong as an ummah. We have to stand together with the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal and be there for one another. Otherwise, on the day of judgment, these brothers and sisters who are suffering, they will be witnesses against us. And we do not want that. May Allah allow us to be able to understand this and give us the capability and means to be able to support them and to bring about the justice of Islam both in our personal lives, in our communities, and globally. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina azab al-nar. Rabbana afriq alayna sabran wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. Rabbana la tuakhidna inna sina wa akhtaana. Rabbana wa la tahmil alayna isran kama hamaltahu ala al-lazina min qablina. Rabbana wa la tuhamilna ma la taqata lana bihi wa afwanna wa gfir lana wa arhamna. Anta maulana fa ansurna ala al-qawm al-kafirin. اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا المستضعفين اللهم انصرهم في الشام اللهم انصرهم في فلسطين اللهم انصرهم في كل مكان عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزدكم واستغفروه يغفر لكم واتقوه يجعل لكم من أمركم مخرجا وأقيموا الصلاة